Number five, Anna Swansinger. Anna Swansinger was born on August 7, 1760 in Bavaria. When she was young, she was physically attractive and she aspired to marry a man of worth. Instead, she married an alcoholic who died when she was just 30 years old. The widow Zanziger needed a job and she wanted a husband. She thought she could attain both when she took a job at the home of a judge as a maid. One roadblock on Zwanziger's path to marriage was the fact that the judge was already married. To eliminate the competition, Swaziger poisoned the judge's wife with arsenic. In the month after his wife died, the judge didn't show any romantic interest in Swaziger, so she moved on to another judge's house. This time, she poisoned the 30-year-old judge to the point where he became seriously ill. She then nursed him back to health. Once he was healthy, she again started to poison him. This time, she killed him. Swanziger moved on to a third judge's house in the spring of 1808. This judge was also married, and his wife was pregnant. On May 13, 1808, she gave birth to a daughter. Three days after giving birth, the judge's wife suddenly became ill. She died a week after giving birth. On her deathbed, she accused Wazinger of poisoning her, but no one took her accusation seriously. Swanzinger continued to work for the judge over the summer. On two separate occasions that summer, guests of the judge became violently ill. After the second incident, Swanzinger was fired, but amazingly, she was given time to finish up some work she was doing. Just before she left, she made coffee for two other housekeepers and was able to give the baby some cookies and milk. It was all laced with arsenic. Both housekeepers survived, but the five-month-old girl did not. After doing all this harm to the families of judges, Swaziger finally came to the attention of the authorities and she was arrested in 1809. She was convicted of murder and she was sentenced to death. Swanzinger even thought that sentencing her to death was the right choice. She said, it is perhaps better for the community that I should die, as it would be impossible for me to stop poisoning people. Swanzinger was beheaded on September 17, 1811. Number 4. Lucusta Lucusta was born sometime in the 1st century AD in Gaul. As an adult, she moved to Rome, where she developed a reputation for being remarkably good at killing people with poison and making it look like they died naturally. Due to her unique skill set, Locusta was hired by rich and important people in Rome. While she was very good at killing people, she wasn't perfect, and she was arrested several times in connections with murders. However, since her clientele were the elite of the Roman Empire, it was in their best interest to get her out of jail as quickly as possible, so Lucusta never stayed in prison long. In 54 AD, Lucusta was summoned to a meeting with Empress Agrippina, the fourth wife and niece of Emperor Claudius. Agrippina wanted Claudius dead so that her son, Nero, could become emperor. Lucusta prepared a batch of poison mushrooms and Agrippina got Claudius to eat them. To ensure that Claudius would die, Lucusta also gave Agrippina a feather with poison on it and Agrippina shoved the feather down Claudius' throat. The poisons worked and Claudius died on October 13, 54 AD and Nero became emperor. Lucusta was thrown into prison and she was given a death sentence for murdering Claudius, but Nero saw further use for her. Claudius had a 14-year-old son named Britannicus, and Nero thought that he would challenge him for the throne. Nero had Lucusta released from prison, and he had her develop a poison to kill Britannicus. Shortly afterwards, Britannicus died after he drank some poison wine. Nero pardoned Lucusta for all her murders, and she became rich under his rule. Lucusta worked out in the open, 
and she even opened a school to teach people how to use poisons. But it all came to an end when Nero's reign ended. Shortly before Nero's death, Bucusta had given him a kid to poison himself, but he didn't use it. Instead, Nero chose to stab himself with his dagger on June 9, 68 AD. As for Lucusta, she was executed in 69 AD. Apparently, she was sexually violated by a giraffe and torn apart by wild animals in front of a large crowd in the Colosseum. Number 3. Hélène J. Dago Hélène J. Dago was born around 1803 in Brittany, France. As an adult, J. Dago held several menial jobs, including being a housekeeper and a seamstress. At almost every home she worked at from 1830 to 1841, someone died suddenly or became gravely ill. That is because J. Dog Doe was poisoning them with arsenic. During those 11 years, she murdered at least 28 men, women, and children. One of those victims was her own sister. In another case, she killed seven people living in one household. Then in 1841, Jade Dago suddenly stopped killing. She apparently didn't pick up her old habit again until 1850. At the time, she was working as a housekeeper and her employee's mother scolded her. This really got under J. Dago's skin. In retaliation, J. Dago poisoned the mother for 18 months, but the mother was one of J. Dago's luckier victims because she ultimately survived. After torturing the elderly woman for a year and a half, J. Dago moved on to another household where she murdered at least three people. She was caught when a doctor finally performed an autopsy on one of her victims and he discovered traces of arsenic. When the authorities confronted her, Shadago immediately denied using arsenic before she was even accused of poisoning anyone, so she was arrested on the spot. Shadago was charged with three murders, but it's believed that she killed at least ten times that amount. Shadago was decapitated via the guillotine on February 26, 1852. Number 2. Catalina de los Rios y Gaspargar. Catalina de los Rios y Gaspargar was born in Chile sometime around 1604 to a rich family. She eventually got the nickname La Quintrella. The nickname was derived from the fact that she had flaming red hair, which was close in color to a Quintrell, which is a red flowered mistletoe. In 1622, when De Los Rios was 18, she took her first life when she poisoned her own father's food. Next, she killed one of her lovers by ordering one of her slaves to kill him. After the murder, she had the slave sentenced to death. In 1626, De Los Rios got married and she seemed to settle down. Her demeanor changed when her husband died when she was 50 years old. Her mean streak emerged with a vengeance. Almost daily, De Los Rios beat and whipped her slaves and indigenous people who lived in the area. Afterwards, she ordered their bodies to be washed with cold water that sometimes contained salt, chilies, or urine. A few days after the beating, just as their bodies were starting to heal, she would whip them again. The human body can only take so much of this type of torture and De Los Rios ended up killing many people. According to reports at the time, she was accused of torturing 40 people to death. De Los Rios avoided arrest and prosecution for years because of her money and her social stature. When the authorities did finally intervene, she was forced to leave her estate, but she never faced any real justice. She died of natural causes in January 1665 and she was interred at her church because she donated a lot of money to the church. Supposedly, the crucifix that she once owned still hangs in the church. Number 1. Elizabeth Bathory Elizabeth Bathory was born in 1560 in Transylvania to a noble family and she had a rather unusual upbringing. 
When she was a young girl, her uncle introduced her to Satanism, and she was also trained in the world of sadomasochism by an aunt. When Bathory was 15, she married a count and moved into a castle in Hungary. By then, Bathory's taste for sadism was in full bloom. To satisfy those needs, her husband had a torture chamber built for her. He even joined her in torturing people and taught her things that he had learned on the battlefield. Bathory had several methods she liked to use to torture her victims. She liked to stick pins and needles under girls' fingernails, or she would cover her victims with honey and then unleash bees and ants on them. When her husband died in 1604, Bathory, or the Blood Countess as she was called, began to get more reckless and bloodthirsty. She would have some of her servants lure young girls to the castle with a promise of work. Once inside the castle, Bathory would torture the girls or have a servant torture them and she'd watch. She would bite her victims so deeply that she was able to tear pieces of flesh off her still living victims. In the case of one young girl, she made her cook and eat a piece of her own flesh. One of the most famous aspects of the Bathory legend is that she killed virgins and bathed in their blood. Most scholars think that this is a myth and there is no way to know if it is true or not. A part of the Bathory story that seems unbelievable, but it's true, is that because of her stature in society, she was able to get away with murdering peasant girls for a decade. Bathory's killing spree finally came to an end in either 1609 or 1610 when the King of Hungary finally chose to send a count to Bathory's castle to investigate the allegations against her. Not long after the Count's arrival, Bathory and her servants were arrested. No one is sure how many girls Bathory slaughtered for her own amusement. She was accused of killing between 80 and 650 girls. Bathory was never tried for her crimes. Instead, she was walled up in a room in the castle with only small slits for food and air. She survived in there, all alone, for three years before she was found dead at the age of 55 in August 1614. Thanks a lot for watching today's video, and thanks to everyone who visited criminallylisted.com and entered the contest. We want to say congratulations to these five winners who were chosen at random and will get in contact with you shortly. If you didn't win, make sure you tune in every week because we'll be sure to have more contests. In the meantime, check out our web store at criminallylisted.com. You can also go there to suggest cases you want to see in future videos. Also, don't forget to check out our Patreon page where you can get access to an exclusive podcast. That can be found at patreon.com slash criminallylisted. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.